Hello, everyone. I'm Nathan Shapura, Senior Political Advisor at the European People's Party. And on behalf of the EPP, welcome to another episode of EPP Family Talks. We are now doing a special edition, an at-home edition for the first time. And we are so thrilled to be able to speak uh, with our first guest in this new series with MEP, Member of the European Parliament, Mr. David Lega from the Christian Democrats in Sweden. Mr. Lega, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. And thanks so much for willing, your willingness to let us into your home a bit. Oh, and thank you for having me. It's a really nice, it's a really nice project. So I'm really happy to be a part of it. It's not a problem at all. So we see a very colorful background there that you have, and I would love to ask we you do, about, don't we? <laughs> about some of those things. Just maybe first of all, tell us uh, how you're doing, how you're coping with this lockdown, and, and maybe also where you're coping with this lockdown. Where is home for you? Uh, my home is in Gothenburg in Sweden. That's Sweden's second largest city on the West Coast. So uh, I, I just took everything out from my home studio and home office, trying to give you a bit more feel of how I live here as well, together with my family. So it's not always, it doesn't always look exactly as it looks now. I usually don't have this scenery when I do uh, web talks, but uh, I wanted to show something different. So maybe the first question I would have is just over your right shoulder, this, this very striking image, this painting. Um, what, is this, what is this about? I, I, actually, it's, it's a copy that I, I made many years ago in Thailand. So it's not that, uh, maybe not politically correct, but I really enjoy it and the colors in it. And uh, my newly born daughter loves to, to watch the red in it. So she, she's always lying in our laps in the, in the uh, chair beside it and just keeps looking at it until she falls asleep. So it works fine. <laughs> well, you have a lot of red, certainly, which is very seasonal, red and green um uh in the in christmas decorations and a in a, in a green plant and a in a fireplace so um, maybe another question about your home but uh, sort of a, a broader question is that is about sweden in general we've heard a lot in this time of covid pandemic throughout the year really about the so-called swedish model yeah. Can you tell us how is sweden doing now how is sweden coping with the pandemic now in december well, I would say that Sweden, unfortunately, is not doing too well. We had way too many deaths compared to our our size and compared to other countries. Um, we had a really, a, a very, very easy lockdown, as you probably know, in Sweden. And unfortunately, it hasn't been working that well at, at all. We got a lot of COVID-19 in our home for the elderly. So many people there suffered and also now with the second wave in the midst of it and not now the government is trying to to do harder restrictions but uh, for me i think we had a two divided message um uh, from the government compared to the uh, governmental authorities as well we haven't been clear in whether we should use face masks whether it's safe to go out or not how many people should meet and that uh, makes us suffer more now than we ought to and how have you yourself been been working you know at home during is this a is it difficult so how are you coping with uh, your actual responsibilities in the european parliament uh, for these last many many weeks well actually i have been working from home since since march since with my disability i'm probably in a risk group as well so i've been trying to be very careful and with my wife uh, being pregnant most of the the this time as well it's been uh, we, we've tried to be safe and it has been working really well. It's naturally, I, I long to come back and to meet people face to face in another way than here. But compared to those who really suffers from this horrible pandemic, for me to work at home is a very small issue and a small problem compared to that. So we're just doing the best of it. I, I am happy that we had many months with this new mandate period before the, uh, the pandemic stroke. So we had time to meet each other and get to know each other before. It would be hard if we started this way without having the, the personal network that we managed to build up since July last year. We've spoken several times before, and I know that you really care about the people you work with and about the, the things you're working on. And so I wanna ask you about that as well in the European Parliament. This is your first mandate in the European Parliament. You're on the Committee for Foreign Affairs. You're also on the Subcommittee for Human Rights. 
Um, of course, you know, there, there's a lot on the agenda and you've been very busy uh, on issues, geopolitical issues uh, relating to these things. You've been very active in our EPP working group on foreign on foreign affairs. So maybe maybe the, the geopolitical question first, uh, how do you see you know, the world at the moment where there's just, just been a, a US election? Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about a new strategy vis-a-vis -vis China. So how do you see the world geopolitics at the moment? Well, I'm happy to hear the, the comments made by President-elect Biden as well to trying to get the world back together to be a more active part in the, in the global community because we do need that. I believe that the European Union and the United States woke up pretty late to the, the economic threat that countries like China poses. It's not only about human rights, even if that is a really, really important issue to me but you also see the economic expansions in every country uh, even in in sweden and in, in gothenburg so for us to work more together to counter these uh, threats are very important to me and i believe that with my with my background uh, as a, a born with a severe disability and then i trained extremely hard and traveled the world as a Paralympic athlete. I was a swimmer in, in the 90s and I saw the situation for so many children around the world in, in, in that perspective, which made me start caring so much about human rights, uh, not at least children's rights all over the world, um, because I saw the possibilities that I got when no one maybe thought or expected that I could have a chance in my life due to my paralyzed arms, for example. And I knew what was right for me. And my goal was to, to become a voice for those who struggles the most being heard all over the world. And actually, people with disabilities and children are an important part of my work in that perspective. Well, I want to ask you about your personal background maybe more in, in a moment, but let's keep it just on the political level for, for, for now. What tools does the European Union have to defend and promote human rights? I know you work on, on issues like this in many, many uh, countries in the world. So what are some of the things that, that are being done and which can be done? Well, I am very, very happy with the progress we're making on the Bagnico ski rules, but also now that we're talking more and more about the due diligence for companies, that's also an important factor. We just need to make sure that it works the same in all our member states and hopefully also later through the World Trade Organization so, so we can have a fair competition with it. And that we, I, I believe that we have many good rules in our, and, and uh, paragraphs in our agreements, but maybe we need to become better at the follow-up and actually use them when we know that something's happened. Not at least concerning countries like Cuba, Venezuela, Belarus, uh, China, Russia, and for anybody who doesn't know, what are the Magnitsky rules you're talking about exactly? Um, uh, how do I explain this properly? Maybe you can help me to explain it really easy for people. Um, well, well, my understanding, I'll just tell you my understanding, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that, that the name comes from, well, from a human rights lawyer who was persecuted by the government of Russia. Uh, and, and it basically refer, started in the U.S. and now the U, European Union is trying to adopt it, um, but refers to basically uh, targeted sanctions against individual, senior individuals, you know, uh, held responsible for serious systematic human rights violations. Is that yes? Is that basically exactly? Correct? And and thus by trying to or managing to do that we affect the people who usually are not being affected by our sanctions. I believe that it, it is a very important instrument if we can find a way to incorporate it as soon as possible. And it looks like the, the majority is turning towards that. So I'm very positive about it. Well, very good. Uh, and a very, I think a very important tool, as you mentioned, uh, going forward. So about your, your, your background, you said you were uh, a swimmer. And I know, uh, so, you know, you were an athlete touring the world for many years. Is this something which you still do? Do you still swim uh, uh, even during lockdown, let's say? No, not at all during lockdown. I, I try to train at home and keep fit at home, but uh, it's also hard with a five-week-old daughter at home. So 
but we're getting back to it as soon as possible, I hope, to, to finding the, the new routines. But for me, physical training, which, which is so important when we talk about it also from a human rights perspective, it's not only, for me, it was never about the competition, so becoming a world champion or getting one of my world records. It was about becoming more and more independent. If you increase your muscles 5%, that's great for me. Five percent more muscle strength means maybe twenty-five percent more independence, and that's why I always use the competitions to find a way to to motivate me, which is harder when now when I don't have them. Well, your uh, situation with a five-week-old um, in the house, uh, I think it's remarkably quiet. Uh, maybe so far, at least in this interview. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have week old in the house. So I, may, I hope you're able to, to get enough sleep uh, in the evenings, enough rest. Uh, but I'm sure it's a, a very nice, you know, very nice it, gift. It's absolutely here. amazing. And uh, the sleep will come later. That's fine. My <laughs> well, maybe let me ask you about something else relating not only to the holidays coming up, but um, also to the issue of human rights, which you've mentioned. And it's something we've talked about before. And that is your own background. You have a Jewish background. Uh, the commission has just uh, un unveiled a new plan for combating anti-Semitism, which is which has been rising uh, very concerningly in Europe in recent years. So, what is your? How do you think anti-Semitism can be pushed back and, and eradicated in Europe? Um, well, to, as as a start, we see the growing tendencies in so many countries. They they usually come within these time lapses of 50, 60 years, and now. We, we have more knowledge on how to fight it and what to accept and not to accept. My, my background on my father's side is that he, my grandfather and my uncle, uh, together with my grandmother, came as refugees in the late 60s from the increasingly then anti-Semitic Poland to, to Sweden and built a new life here. So naturally, this is a, an important part of my identity. Um, and we see that the way that politicians, especially in Sweden, we have a, a large problem that people's view of Jews in general is largely affected of their view of the actions of the state of Israel. 86% of Swedes uh, mix up their view of the Jewish people with the, the state of Israel, which is really dangerous. Uh, uh, because religion is one thing, freedom of religion is extremely important and politics is another. And I will always fight for Israel as well, but we need to make sure that people understand the difference, not at least in these times. Hopefully now when we see the increasing peace process of Israel with other countries in the Middle East, where, which is a, an amazing uh, uh, success story, uh, that will lessen the anti-Semitic movement as well in, in Europe. And that final point you mentioned with regards to the Abraham Accords is something I know the, 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 the Working Group on Foreign Policy, which you've been active in, has also, has also dealt with and, and, focused on, yeah. uh, and focused on also. I think- so, uh, I, I am an, uh, an active member of the Working Group Against Anti-Semitism, and I am the, will always try to to put a light on these issues because many countries need to do more when it happens, before it happens, and not only after something horrible happens. We need to respect the, the worries and concerns of the many Jewish congregations in, in Europe and try to, to help them to feel more safe. I, I'm not sure I can see it very clearly, but is there a is there a menorah um, behind you somewhere along with the Christmas stocking? Uh, yes, ne next to the stockings, we have the Hanukkah, <laughs> stocking Hanukkah. of Hanukkah next week. So okay. uh, with my background and my wife's background, we are going to celebrate both holidays, and which is important for our family to know and respect all of it. Well, when you say next week, I think that we might be publishing this uh, on a different day than when we record it. So it could be the same day that that it's recorded. In fact, that we're celebrating. Uh, that is that know, is right. 
um, well, is there a, so a couple of maybe just more, more fun, uh, informal questions to finish the interview. Is there a particular holiday tradition you're looking forward to? Well, I mean, you will always remember and carry the, the traditions with you from, from your own childhood when you celebrate both Hanukkah with, with, um, with my, my family and the gifts and the dinner. And now I, I really look forward to starting introducing these, all these uh, traditions to my own family and to mix them up with my uh, wife Vega's background as well. So we can have, have both a Christmas tree and a Hanukkah. And for me, that is what's most important. It's, it's not, I mean, I'm, I'm an active member of the Christian Democratic Party with a Jewish background. And that for me is so important that politics is about values. It's, it's not a, about faith. Um, both are important, but it's also important to, to see and acknowledge the difference. Well, in all the meetings that you've ever been a part of, that, that, I've, that I've been a part of as well, in all of the, the interviews that we've done before, this is always a point that you make so clearly, and that's the, the, the Christian democratic values of the EPP family. Um, and so thank you so much for that and for your clarity and, and courage and conviction in doing that. If I could, I'd like to ask you one final question, which we try to ask all of our, all of our guests. And that is it's a simple question, but it's always fun to get the response. And that is, do you have a, a book or a series or a film that you would like to recommend? Well, right now, I, I think it's important with diversity there as well. So I, I follow both The Crown on Netflix and and the Mandalorian on Disney Plus, which I think both have their absolute strength. Uh, and I just finished reading uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, autobiography. So that, that was a really good book as well. So you have sci-fi and history. I think uh, for me, that's really the balance of it. Well, that's probably food for, <laughs> you know, uh, food for another whole conversation. So maybe we'll just leave it there for now. Uh, Mr. David Lega, member of the European Parliament, representing the Christian Democrats from Sweden. Thanks so much for your time and for inviting us into your home for this at-home edition of EPP Family Talks. Thank you so much and uh, look forward to seeing all of you in person as well, so as soon as possible. To you as well. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah and uh, Happy New Year. The same to you. Happy holidays.